Now, I was asked to talk about the future of digital public health. Um, I think, just have to think first, where is it now? Um, and if you think about the positives of what the internet has brought uh, and, and digital technology has brought to uh, public health, um, it's made it possible already uh, worldwide to, in principle, have 24-7 uh, access to free information and advice on a whole host of health problems that's been put up there by experts, both professional experts and indeed other people with the health problems. And I think that's a wonderful revolution and that's the kind of thing that we've appreciated uh, the internet doing across a whole range of things. And actually, um, I have to say that myself, I've benefited from this because I spent the last 10 years developing interactive digital interventions to help people um, with a huge variety of health problems. And I've you know, um, taken them through to trialing, showed that they were cost effective, getting them rolled out through the NHS and so on. So um, I, I don't want to criticize uh, uh, this, this capacity, which um, has, has been really great. But that's the positives. Actually, when I started thinking about the negatives, there were rather more of them, unfortunately. Um, so there has been an absolute explosion of information, advice, apps, and so on. Um, so much so that it's actually very difficult uh, for people out there, uh, both ordinary members of the public and indeed practitioners, to identify trustworthy, effective behaviour change support. Um, and there is a real downside to that. Some people say, does it matter? You can just give it a try. But if people try uh, behaviour change support that doesn't work a few times, then they get terribly disillusioned, both in the possibility of support and in their own ability to change. And that can really uh, lead to uh, negative effects on future behaviour change. And of course, these kinds of interventions are actually based on information mainly and advice. They're individually focused. And we know that that's actually not a very good way to change behavior. So uh, it's not the most powerful tool that we, we could be using. Um, and there's also been, unfortunately, uh, not a lot of attention paid to making these kinds of resources accessible and useful for those in most need. So, um, they're mainly taken up by people that are educated and already uh, have quite healthy behaviour. Um, and, and that's a lot to do with the way they're designed. When I've been designing our own interventions, we've gone out and we've made sure that they are accessible and engaging for people with lower levels of uh, literacy and computer literacy. And you can do that, but it's very seldom done. And the result has been um, that it, there's uh, definitely a risk that they've actually contributed to widening health inequalities. So that's where we are now. Where do we want to head? I think it's quite easy to imagine how digital technology could support um, public health better by creating an environment, um, partly digital but linked to the real environment, that automatically prompts and supports healthy behaviour without people having to go out and engage with it deliberately. Um, and everything that we've heard today suggests that that's what you need, an automatic environmental prompting and support for habitual behaviour. Um, now, how could you do that? Well, there's new capabilities, of course, for unobtrusive, continuous sensing of everything we do. So from wearables, internet of things, um, social media, to detect situations where people could benefit from behaviour change support. So this uh, little image is, um, I think it's a Microsoft fridge, um, <laughs> which it's actually designed to find out uh, when you need to reorder some of your foods. Um, but you can easily imagine a sort of public health version of that that was linked up with um, an intervention that Paul Aviard and I are currently developing, which, um, when you do your internet shopping, suggests healthy swaps. Um, so you could easily imagine that so that your fridge is automatically making healthy choices when it orders your food in for you, creating a nice environment at home of healthy food. And, of course, um, artificial intelligence uh, would be an important part of this whole system and, and the kind of modelling that Bruce was talking about um, could be used to trigger just-in-time interventions. 
and um, there's some really nice work being done on how that can be not sort of the kinds of um, effortful um, conscious processing, but just uh, exactly the right nudges at the right time that are brief and engaging. However, um, science fiction is already telling us about uh, where this could lead us in terms of um, you know, uh, having assistants that uh, really are dominating our lives. So one of the questions that we need to think about is, is this kind of future something that we want? I think half of the answer is that whether we want it or not, it's going to happen. Because as people were saying earlier, there are um, commercial interests, there are forces that are going to create this digital environment uh, for better or for worse, and we might want to harness it for better to the extent we can. So with the second half of the talk, I just want to talk about how might we go about uh, harnessing and reaching this future? What kind of methodological advances do we need? Um, and, of course, we've heard a lot about complexity. We need to recognise how complex changing behaviour is. And I mean complex in every sense, including the lay sense of the word. We need to devote really substantial effort, investment and creativity into it. And actually, the level of investment into developing interventions is still much, much lower than the level of investment into every other aspect of, um, of our healthcare system uh, research. And it's really hard work to develop uh, a, a good intervention that's going to work. It takes lots of careful design, development, targeting and tailoring. Um, I'm just going to give two very, very brief examples from my decade of research. Um, actually, no, this one even preceded the internet. I was asked by um, the rather unfortunately named um, Help the Aged um, Third Sector Organisation, which is now called Age UK, um, to research why older people, um, how we could get them to undertake falls prevention activities. And uh, through my um, qualitative research with the older people, it became very clear, first of all, that you had to omit the word falls from anything that you did with them. So strength and balance training, they all signed up for immediately and loved it. Uh, falls prevention, None of them fall, uh, had fallen, actually. Not even the ones that had had hip fractures and were in hospital having rehabilitation. They hadn't actually fallen. They tripped. Um, so you get that in, other, in, a, in an asthma intervention. Uh, we wanted to do the front cover of our booklet. Um, it was about breathing retraining for asthma. We started off with a pair of lungs. People hated that. It was really medical. They didn't want to think of themselves as ill. So we had a lovely picture of somebody doing breathing retraining. People thought that was far too trendy and um, not the kind of thing they were into. Uh, so we ended up with this, which people liked. And this really matters. It was the first page of our booklet. People wouldn't even open it or would open it with a very negative attitude if we didn't get the image right. So. I'm just giving you that as an example of how much effort it took just to take the first page or the heading of our intervention to get that right. So, what do we need to do? We need better triangulation of methods for developing and evaluating interventions. Now, I'm quite surprised actually that nobody, I think, has mentioned to a great degree, participatory co-design um, today, which with users and stakeholders, which is obviously gaining huge traction absolutely rightly. However, um, as somebody who is a designer and developer, I don't think we should be seeing it as a complete solution. Um, sometimes people think, we'll just hand it over to uh, the, the target users and they can design and develop it for us. That's really unfair. Um, even my most senior research fellows, uh, after 12 years' experience, probably don't um, have quite the wealth of experience to draw on that I have. Um, and, and your users are going to struggle to design from scratch uh, interventions. They can have an incredibly useful input into helping you know what works and what doesn't, but you can't just rely on them. So our own method, we do a, a huge amount of iterative, qualitative and mixed methods research. Um, I was told to be looking future, not back, so I haven't talked about my research. If you want to see our methods um, in my biography in the um, booklet, we, we, uh, I've, I give a reference to it. But um, <clears throat> yes, so we do a huge amount of 
uh, of this kinds of reaching out to the kinds of users who may not engage uh, in participatory co-design. So the hard to reach people, the people with the low literacy uh, and so on. Um, so you have to go out and actually see how they're going to react to your interventions. But then you want to, want to also, as well as getting people's user views, have objective measures of usage, of outcomes, of maybe physiological reactions, um, where their attention is, um, their visual attention and so on, uh, because people can't always reflect or accurately report on, on what is influencing them. Of course, you want experimental testing. Now, again, in the digital health, people are starting to say, do we need to have controlled trials? Um, actually, I'd say the other way around. Why not have them? Because it's so easy, which, of course, uh, Facebook has shown and Google. They do these uh, controlled trials every single day without our permission or knowledge. Um, we probably don't want to quite copy them in that. But um, digital interventions, the easiest in the world to be doing constant um, evaluations using all sorts of uh, advanced uh, capabilities and designs. So add all this together, I think what we want to be heading towards probably is the counterpart of what we're starting to get already um, in the medical system of um, health learning, learning health systems, um, but here we need public health learning systems, which are adaptive systems uh, where you're co continuously collecting real world data through all these unobtrusive sensing systems uh, that can trigger interventions, these little just-in-time nudges, and evaluate and continuously improve the interventions. Um, and to achieve this, we need huge collaborations between all of us from lots of different disciplines, uh, health behaviour, social and organisational systems, technology, environment, design, policy, economics, and so it goes on. But I think we also need to partner with the people that are going to be uh, implementing and sustaining these kinds of systems. And those are going to be huge pub private and public sector partners. Um, Ultimately, they'll probably be the global digital giants. Um, <clears throat> they're going to be the people that the platforms uh, with the data uh, that will be able to, to, to do this kind of work. Um, and I think for the better or the worse, we, we're going to have to find ways of working with them. Uh, and that's where I think for, my, for this area, the most important policy initiative might be to start to put the kinds of incentives, funding structures and business models in place that genuinely encourage these kinds of partnerships. At the moment, they don't exist. And at the moment, there is this divide between the interests of healthcare businesses and, and uh, the interests of maybe the health of the population. And we just need the right policies to join those together. Um, <clears throat> so um, I just want to end the last slide. Um, that's the vision I have, and, and just a very naughty problem that is um, facing me at the moment. As I go from uh, finishing clinically trialling interventions, showing they're cost effective, to going to try to roll them out and implement them, having to partner with private sector and public sector organisations for that, and then they get transferred and um, transmuted. And of course, I know this is a... a Outside the digital world, it's a problem. How do you roll out at scale uh, with, without these things? And this ties back to the whole questions that we've been talking about. Like, what are the key ingredients of an intervention? How do you maintain them? How do you know if they're still there? And how can we transpose them across all the contexts we want globally and in the future, all the different formats technology is going to throw up? That's what I want to say then.